Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, the DeKalb Library Foundation, and Poetry Atlanta, welcome to our annual Voices Carry Poetry Reading. We are so very excited to present the Docative Poets this evening, and we can't wait to get this event started. A few things, though, before we begin. We will have a Q&A session after the formal presentation. So if you would like to ask any of our poets this evening a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A feature. You can find it at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. You can also type it into the chat and we will try to keep track of those as best we can. We also have enabled live transcriptions tonight for our hearing impaired patrons. So you can find that by locating the CC button at the top or the bottom of your device. And then you can adjust the font size to your needs. Right now, of course, I would like to turn this over to Colin Kelly, and he's going to introduce all of our poets. But I would like to remind you also that Karis Books and more here in Decatur, Georgia, is our bookseller for this evening. Because of course, like every other author, poets need your love too. So do show your love to our poets this evening. Show your love to our independent bookstores who have done so much during the past 18 months during this pandemic and support them as well. So right now, Colin Kelly, who is the editor of Atlanta in Town Magazine. He is a former award member of the Georgia Center for the Book, and he is a novelist and poet himself, and is such a great friend and partner to our organization. He is here once again to welcome you all this evening and to tell you a little more about our poets. Colin? Good evening, everyone. It's really uh, exciting to be here because I haven't been doing anything for the last little bit, so it's really great to be here. Uh, to introduce uh, the poets tonight and to be part of Voices Carry. Uh, so we're going to jump right in and I'm going to say that we have poets calling in literally from all over the world. Cecilia Wallach is in Poland, Stephen uh, Rains is in LA, Khadijah Queen is in Virginia, and Katie and Ilya are here in Atlanta with me, but you know we could not have this kind of reading uh, you know without Zoom. So while I'm looking forward to getting back to some live ratings. It is really exciting uh, to have all these poets with us tonight for Voices Carry. So I'm going to jump in and I'm going to read the bios for each of the poets who's going to be reading tonight. And this is the order they will be going in. Um, and we'll get right into it. And then we're going to have a little Q&A afterwards. So stick around. If you've got questions, you can put them in chat. Uh, or we'll, you'll be able to unmute and ask your question. Uh, and yes, please support the poets by buying their books from Karis Books and More Indicator. It's, it's so important. You're not only importing, supporting the poets, but you're also supporting a great independent bookstore. Okay, so jumping in. So our first reader is Cecilia Bala. She is a multi-award winning poet who is teaching in Warsaw, Poland on a Fulbright Fellowship. And that is just one of her many honors, which also include an NEA grant, a push, a push cart prize, and inclusion in Best American Poetry. Her collections include Sigan, the Gypsy Poem, Carpathia, Earth, Narcissus, and Late. Then we'll have Ilya Kaminsky, who is the author of the award-winning collections Dancing in Odessa and Deaf Republic, which won the LA Time Book Prize, among many others, and was named Best Book of the Year by just about every publication in the world. He is the director of Poetry at Tech. Katie Ferris is the author of the award-winning chat book, A Net to Catch My Body in Its Weaving, and the forthcoming Standing in the Forest of Being Alive, which is coming in 2023 from Alice James Books. She is an associate professor at Georgia Tech. Khadijah Queen is the award-winning poet and playwright. Her latest collection, Anodyne, was published last year, and she's also the author of I'm So Fine, A List of Famous Men and What I Had On, Conduit, Fearful Beloved and Black Peculiar. She is a professor at Virginia Tech and the 2021 Aaron's Visiting Poet at Tulane. And finally, we will have Stephen Rains, who was the inaugural Poet Laureate of West Hollywood and is the author of Inheritance and A Quilt for David, recently published to great acclaim by City Lights Books. He edited My Life is Poetry, showcasing his students' work from the first ever autobiographical poetry workshop for LGBT seniors. And he also created the Gay Rub, an exhibition of rubbings from LGBT landmarks that is toured around the country and was the subject of a documentary film. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cecilia Wallach 
who is beaming in from Warsaw, Poland. Thank you, Colin. Would that I were beaming in from Warsaw. I'm actually in a city called Zhezhov. Um, Warsaw is easier to pronounce. Um, so, Dobry uh, Vietcher. It's one in the morning here in Zhezhov. Um, Zhezhov is about two hours east of Krakow and two hours north of the little Carpathian village where my paternal grandmother was born. So that's where I am, but I'm thrilled to be with all of you, with these poets, especially with Colin, especially with Katie, especially with Khadija, who I haven't seen in so long, and Ilya Kaminsky and Stephen Rains. It's really just an honor to be part of this, this lineup. So I won't blab, I will read some newish poems. Um, I've been talking recently to friends about how the world that I was spinning in doesn't spin anymore. And um, who knew that the way we were living was gonna come to such an abrupt halt or the way I was living certainly. And um, I'm not sure that world is coming back. So this first poem is a poem for Dacha. And Dacha is um, both a town at the tip of the Dacha Peninsula and the peninsula. Um, in southern Turkey. Poem for Dacha. We didn't know the world we loved was ending. We didn't know how much we loved that world. How I could fly from Los Angeles to Paris, fly from Paris to Istanbul, from Istanbul take a bus to the Black Sea coast of Bulgaria and back. Travel south to Dalaman, to Marmaris. Travel west along the crest of an emerald green peninsula. 50 miles in Meltem wind. Cliffs falling away on either side. The blue-green Aegean below and below the blue-green Mediterranean. All the way to the sleepy town of Dacha, where we met in the dark street and kissed. Everything seemed still possible then, and we lived those days as if blessed by warm breezes and called this paradise. The lame goat tied to a tree on the hillside where we made love in the back of your jeep. The small dog that followed us through the town into sunny cafes where we met friends for tea. That morning, you whistled a tune by Bregovich across the table from me as I wrote, remember, remember this. We swam in both seas and both seas were golden. And on moonlit nights, we climbed to the roof of your house to be nearer the stars. You have a home here now, you said. And we planned where we'd meet again, in Berlin or in Paris or Istanbul, or high in the Caucasus Mountains, deep in the green of the singing world. We weren't thinking of bombs or coups, although even then the bombs were falling. Refugees crowded the buses and stations, and Atatürk Turk airport was full of assassins, strangers in transit bearing strange passports, slipping into the country and out again. Even then, attacks were being planned, and governments were falling left and right to the right, and those taking power into their hands, stockpiling weapons, hardening borders, were taking that world away from us. Still, there was music in the streets those nights, the sky filled with gulls and the call to prayer. I still believed I could just keep going. You still believed you could go for days without washing the sea out of your hair. It's for my friend Shafak. This is a, a Carpathian poem called Unabashed. I wanted to write a love poem, unabashed. I wanted stepping into the meadow to bend down and kiss the tips of grass. And then I wanted to take it with me, the meadow, 
everywhere I went. So I plucked a buttercup, a sprig of what I thought was yarrow once, and then some blue and purple flowers and made of my plunder a small bouquet. I wanted my foot on the stones in the river where my grandmother's foot had stepped, then to lie on my back in the sun and let the butterfly swarm my hair. I wanted to piss in the dirt and did, crouching behind a willow next to the river in waist deep green to put my body into the body of that earth as fluid gold. And then I wanted the storm that came with its blue black wind and sheets of rain to tear me back into the sky. This is um, an elegy for my, my nephew, Jesse, Jesse Caldwell Higginbotham, who um, died in his 17th year. And it begins with, the, the title is from a poem that Jesse wrote when he was um, about nine years old. And the cherry tree in their backyard was, they thought they would have to um, cut it down because it, something was wrong with it. And he wrote this poem uh, that included this line and they found a way to save the tree. Is it gone, this place of sweet blossoms? Sister, all I can do is pray for you and prayers won't bring him back. Your one child gone from kiss to ash, from flesh and bone and blood to smoke. No one calls to you the way he called, his throat still rough with sleep, the whole day waiting in his shoes. When he was small, he ran through summer grass, gold light in every breath. He sang his small, sweet songs. He climbed the branches flowering and called the tree by name. Once he stuck a twig into the dirt, commanded, grow. And as he grew, your wiry son, each thing he touched, he turned to hum and brightness, algorithm, poem. I dreamt you spoke to me of hell and nearly fell into my arms. What was his life? He was a kid who'd had a bike, some gadgets, socks with holes in them. And then he almost was a man. And then, and all at once, just gone. You found your way back to the garden, I've been told. So sweat and dirt and sunlight then. You made a boy once who will not be made again. You called him yours. This is a poem for another sister, my youngest sister, um, and for her dog who was named Honey. So it's called Honey. And it begins with a quote from uh, a letter that Emily Dickinson wrote to Thomas Higginson. You ask of my companions, hills, sir, and the sundown, and a dog as large as myself. Strange music of our Emily, strange shadow at the door, who crept in silence tenderly, put word against hard word. What tune might she unbraided hum to soothe my sister's grief? I think she'd offer neither hymn nor poem to her, but kneel beside the girl who loved the wild, tamed creature dying now, the dog whose honey-colored pelt still gleams, the darkened gold of afternoon when Emily might help her lift the weight, not from her heart, no fragile thing, the love that loves past death, to bear it to the patch of earth, to dig bare hands beneath thin snow, 
that grave a grass of a, that brief a grave of grass and dirt, a cradle for such bones. This is a prose poem called By the Light of Pain, Another Light. There's never any guarantee that what anyone tells me is true. A young woman said to have gone out for milk at 4 a.m., taking the child along with her, may have in fact been trying to get as far away as she could. The child may have been in danger, may still be, or not. What I see is the brokenness, the wish for escape, for solid ground. What I see is an open field drenched in light that we're walking toward. Maybe that field is God and only God can rescue us. I ask my brother to pray and he does. I ask my eldest sister if a hundred dollars would help. I pray the field will open before us, green and golden, a hallowed place. Here is the hand of the Lord, the hand of the child, safely in my hand. Give us this light by the light of pain, another light, deeper and gentler than any we've known before. Make us a home of the flowering earth. Forgive us our brokenness. Let the child grow tall as wheat. Let there be bread for his mother too. I'll finish with a short poem that's um, a kind of a coda uh, to the first poem. It's also Dacha, summer of 2015. It's called Peace. When the world was not at war and the lame goat stood tethered to a tree there on a rocky hill in the moonlight, and below in the moonlight, also the sea, where I and my friend who loves to sing made of the shadows a kind of bed, but did not sleep. It was not a dream, nor was the morning, nor was the breeze that made of each room another room. We were passing through our lives alive. There was no time, and for whole afternoons, we did not fear death. We did not buy jewels from the wooden stalls that lined the beach, although we lingered there at dusk among them, touched the polished stones. We wanted for nothing. We ate the fruit that was set before us. We sipped our tea. The lame goat healed. The rope was cut. As I left, I promised that I would return. And then I kissed my friend goodbye in the same street where I'd kissed him hello when the world was not at war. Thank you. Thank you again, Colin, for putting this together for us. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for this really beautiful, beautiful reading. And so wonderful to see you after all this time. And thank you, Colin, for gathering us together with such grace. Thank you to Georgia Center for the books. And I'm really, really pleased and delighted for the chance to read this wonderful post today. Um, as you might have noticed that I speak with a pretty heavy Russian accent. So I'm going to put in the chat the links to four poems that I'll read today. That way, hopefully, um, you'll be able to follow. The first poem was called Author's Prayer. Author's Prayer. If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal up my body, 
I must write the same poem over and over for an empty page is a white flag of their surrender. If I speak for them, I must walk on the edge of my sand. I must leave the blind man who runs through the rooms without touching the furniture. Yeah, I leave. I can cross the street just in what it is. I can dance in my sleep and laugh in front of the mirror. Even sleep is a prayer, love. I will praise your madness and the language not mine. Speak of music that wakes, music in which we move. For whatever I say is a kind of petition, and the darkest days must I praise. Um, I will also read three poems from. Tough Republic. The first one is called We Live It Happily Here in the World. We live it happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed. Around my bed, America was fallen. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In a six month of a disastrous rain. In a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, a great country of money. We, for the us, live happily during the war. So, Deaf Republic is a story in the verse um, about a pregnant woman and her husband in a time of crisis. Um, I'm going to read one last poem about them and then uh, one poem from the end of the book. Before the war, we made a child. Before the war, we made a child. I kissed a woman whose freckles served as a neighbor's. She had a mole on her shoulder which she displayed like a medal for bravery. Her trembling lips might come to bed. Her hair would have fallen in the middle of the conversation when come to bed. I walked in my barber shop of this. Yeah. I lived her love to bed on the chair of my hairy arms. But part it leaves. When bite my part it leaves slime under the cool sheets. Sonia. The things we did. And the final poem I'll read today uh, is called The Town watches them back of us. Now each of us is a witness stand. Vasenka watches us and watch foot soldiers draw Alfonso Brabinski on a sidewalk. We let them take him, all of us cowards, what we don't say. We carry in our suitcases our coat pockets, our nostrils. Across the street, they watch him with fire hoses. First he screams and he stops so much sunlight. A t-shirt falls off a clothes line and an old man stops, picks it up, presses it to his face. Neighbors line up to watch him drown on the sidewalk like a body will lock, ta-da! With so much sunlight, each of us is a witness that they take Alfonso, and no one turns up. Our silence turns up for us. Thank you.
Well, I don't think anybody envies me following uh, that performance. Um, but here I am, nevertheless. <laughs> um, so I am going to be reading from my book, A Net to Catch, Catch My Body and It's Weaving. Um, it's a chat book that just came out um, this past year. And it, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a content warning um, that it follows my, uh, my year with breast cancer. Um, and so uh, I just want to let you know ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to start off with the first poem in the book, which is called Why Write Love Poetry in a Burning World. To train myself to find in the midst of hell what isn't hell. The body, bald, cancerous, but still beauty, beautiful enough to imagine living, the body replacing the front porch step, the body chewing what it takes to keep a body going. This scene has a tune, a language I can read. This scene has a door I cannot close. I stand within its wedge, I stand within its shield. Why write love poetry in a burning world? to train myself in the midst of a burning world, to offer poems of love to a burning world. Okay, um, so the book has a lot to do with Emily Dickinson and you might recognize one of her more famous lines in here. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is called Tell It Slant. You float in the MRI gloam several spiculated masses. I name you cactus, carcinoma bedamned. You make a desert of all of me. Have I said it slant enough? Here's a shot between the eyes. Six days before my 37th birthday, a stranger called and said, you have cancer, unfortunately, and then hung up the phone. Uh, this is called In the Event of My Death. What used to be a rope descending my vertebrae to the basement of my spine grows thin. In solidarity with my first chemotherapy, our cat leaves her whiskers on the hardwood floor. I gather them, each pure white parenthesis, and plant them in the throat of the earth. In quarantine, I learned to trim your barbarian hair. Now it stands always on end, a tribute to my superior Barbary skills. In the event of my death, promise you will find my heavy braid and bury it. I will need a rope to let me down into the earth. I've hidden others strategically around the globe, a net to catch my body in its weaving. Um, <laughs> this next poem is called Rachel's Chair, um, and uh, this book, in addition to kind of chronicling my experiences with cancer, is also uh, a love, uh, a, a book of love poems, so this is uh, Rachel's Chair. Once, many years ago, we made love at a friend's house. We were overnight guests, not perverts, on the whole, uh, but what I'm trying to say is she owned a chair so perfect for lovemaking that we joked about asking to take it home. If I had only known then how rarely we would find such objects, I would have. Um, I'm gonna read a, a, a new poem or a poem that didn't make it into the book. Um, it is fairly explicit and it has to do with the fact that a fact I didn't know about chemotherapy, which is it's pretty common uh, before you lose the hair on your head that you're going to lose your pubic hair. Um, and so this is, it, it happened all at once, and this is about that moment. <laughs> um, it is, does not have a title at, at this point. He joined me in the shower just as my rootless pubes began to surrender themselves into my palm extravagant, their orange abandon. 
witnessing my shock, he started gathering wool, a greedy cartoon grin on his face, until our laughter chased the stray dogs of our tears, which follow every bivouac down into the drain. Okay, I won't subject you <laughs> to anything that explicit. Again, I'm going to read, let's see, mm, two more poems. Uh, one, this one is called Scheduling the Bone Scan. The word bone tolls in your ear, a bell. What tolls? The word, the bone, the drum in your ear moves the hammer like a lever. A bone moves the word bone through your ear. You repeat bone, your voice droning, not silver, bronze, a duller thud, nothing ringing, instead a buzz, the insect, time. And the last poem is called Standing in the Forest of Being Alive. I stand in the forest of being alive. In one hand, a cheap aluminum pot of chicken stock and in the other, a heavy book of titles. Oh, once walking through a cemetery, I became terribly lost and could not speak. No one living knows the grammar. No one could direct me to the grave, so I looked at every name. A heavy bird flapped its wing over someone's sepulcher. Some of us are still putzes in death, catching bird shit on headstones. Some of us never find what we're looking for, praying it doesn't pour before we find our names, certain we're headed in the right direction. A drizzle begins, and what's nameless inside our veins fluoresces, fluoresces in the rain. Thank you. Hello, uh, what a privilege to lead with this um, esteemed group of poets. I really appreciate you Colin for inviting me. Uh, to rejoin Voices Carry after so many years. Um, I'm going to read a piece um, that was published in Harper's Magazine about the pandemic. I sort of went back and forth over whether I wanted to read regular poems. This is a Zuhitsu and I hardly ever read it. So I thought I would do this. It's called False Dawn. I collect living things at the end of their lives. Faint, failed, gift of a rose half bloomed before having enough. Dried lilac pressed between high shelved Lee Spectre volume and Alejandra Pizarnik's extracting the stone of madness. Late summer pine cone brushing the spine of Lucille Clifton collected. Snapped from the vine to save the others, a yellowed philodendron leaf. Was it the lavender incense I burned the nights I couldn't sleep? Did I make a mistake leaving it in water so long? It thrived all year until now. I brought it home from my office when campus closed, watched the roots deepen their tangle as they lengthened. Maybe I just need to find the right soil for rescue rescue the action as opposed to miracle, a noun received, which shifts responsibility to some mysterious else. I want to behave responsive, responsibly in preserving any life or honoring its end, hands moving not in slight, but service. I place the second philodendron leaf to lose all of its dark onto the writing desk in my bedroom. The yellow, an almost sick yellow green, makes me want to paint. I keep saying that to myself out loud on Instagram, trying to make it real. Brushes and watercolors, ochre, alizarin, quinacridone, gold, viridian, carmine, lamp black, paint gray, Prussian blue, 
tucked in a fabric box. Unused, have they lost their power? What are we made to do? News of empty meat shelves and workers denied protection and whiny Orange County surfers threaten a measured recovery, the health of beloveds, and aren't strangers too beloveds. Do we not call each other brother, sister in certain gatherings? The virus doesn't choose who is a stranger, we do. Moon through curtain crack, a thin ambient light. Artichokes, asparagus, aspens, autumn, I list what I appreciate. Stray notes to triangulate out of haze. On the first day of quarantine, my mother stood next to the patio doors without opening them. Our apartment building in suburban Colorado is shaped almost like a honeycomb with a courtyard in the center. We overlook a fountain, brilliant sky. She said, the sun got nerve enough to shine. She'll be 82 this year. Rare now, a hug, smoothing hair in passing, clasping hands. The times I made banana bread before the pandemic, I forgot to separate wet and dry ingredients before mixing. I'd read the directions once and think I remember correctly. This time I read them again because it's been a while and realize that as usual, moving too fast leads to mistakes. To slow down a daily decision, moment by moment. What else could I have saved from ruin? I exaggerate. What else could I have done correctly? I think of joy as well as loss, missed taste, lighter texture, I think about the poems I wrote out of rage and despair, bound in a book with a beautiful cover, wonder if I crafted them to fall apart. In New York, my younger sister has a fever. She doesn't often get sick and she is so tired, she cannot get up without vertigo spinning her back down. On FaceTime, her children climb all over her, pull her arms, snuggle into her neck, touch the outside of her mask. She is too weak and out of breath to stop them. She coughs. I beg her to get the test. I beg her to rest. I beg my brother-in-law to stop working and help her with the kids. He won't. My sister gave up a career in real estate so he could build his. My mother wants to bring the kids here, but she and my sister aren't even speaking. I yell at my mother to fix it beg her to apologize, she won't. I bought a hooded Tyvek suit in early March after Naomi Campbell posted a video wearing one. It takes all my strength not to pack it up and drive across six states to the epicenter. Lemon balm tea, raw honey, vegan toast, blackberries, white bean soup with carrots, parsley, white pepper, and black pepper. End of week, May 3rd, 2020, 843 deaths in Colorado. In my county, up 20.4% from last week. Legionnaire's disease can travel through air conditioning vents, my son discovers. He is a gamer and likes to keep track of rules and facts. The largest outbreak of Legionnaire's in New York City's history in the South Bronx in 2015 was spread by cooling towers. The warmer it gets, the less use these ceiling fans will be. Masked up, glasses on, hair covered by hood or the black Gorin Brothers hat I bought in California, I drive to Firestone, Frederick, Longmont, Erie, bring paper booties, gloves, sanitizer, wipes. In the middle of this chaos, I am trying to buy a house. March and April event cancellations came fraught, swift. I cancel my trip to San Antonio to appear on scholarly panels and meet up with poet friends I only see once a year. I cancel a vacation in Charleston with my sister, her first since the kids were born. I postpone a weekend getaway to Santa Fe with new friends, not writers, 
fellow fans of spas and French food. Took my whole life to allow such pleasures. Rescheduling, indefinite. Then May, June, July events, poof. I return clothes I bought for performances while I still can. The line at Nordstrom Rack stretches so far they rope us off in an L shape from the front of the store all the way to the back. Fourth of March, I'm the only one wearing gloves and a mask. The cashier has a pump bottle of sanitizer next to the register, but he doesn't use it. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit to just read the last couple of sections. A story blinks nonstop in my Twitter feed in May. A man in Flint, a security guard at a family dollar, killed in anger. The rage source, the killer's sister being told to wear a mask. His nickname was Duper, short for Super Duper. His eight children, his mother, his wife and family and friends shattered into mourning, embracing in masks, weeping. There's a sea of mylar balloons and lit candles. Every loss incalculable. Asthma and other chronic health issues keep both my son and my mother at risk. My mother takes so much medication we have an Excel spreadsheet to keep track. They've sheltered in place for eight weeks. I'm at risk too, but I try not to think about it. I have to be the one going out. I have to be the one who works even if I work at home. I record lectures from my students, answer their emails, respond to their poems and essays and questions, try to remain a stable and generous presence for them as the world shuts down. My oldest niece calls to ask about our heritage, names, places, and dates of birth and death. My mother tells me a story, fighting snow, looking for a job in Detroit. My grandmother's mother contracted the flu, then pneumonia. A hundred years ago, she died. March 31st, the peak day for deaths in France. 7,578 souls counted. I vault into memories of our summer in 2019 in Paris, Lyon, Arles, Rouen. My son and I have become those people who talk about France all the time, missing the luxe contrast of traveling during an unprecedented heat wave, the ease of our existence there. No suspicion during our exploratory walks and captain rides, no feeling of being unwelcome in shops and plenty of unexpected kindness. We planned to go back in winter, spill into crisp Cote d'Azur light again. I wanted to visit Baldwin's home in St. Paul de Vence and go inside, not just touch the wooden door. But we don't know any when or where anymore. My anxiety infuses tweets, texts, calls, trip to the, trips to the store for more food and supplies, I can't worry about how I look to my colleagues. That would make it worse. More panic attacks in a month than I've had in the past four years. I worry about people being tired of me, but I worry more about the risk of dis disconnection. Early in lockdown, back to back, three writers lost to suicide. One text read with friends is called, holy fuck. I'm just gonna read the last little bit. Thank you. One Thursday, the robins flooded my morning. American, orange-breasted on bare branches aiming for the light behind thin clouds. I find out philodendrons need indirect sun. I move this living thing closer to shadow.
Stephen, you are up. Sorry about that. Uh, I was having trouble. Um, so I'm Stephen Rains, and I really, I, it's so uh, moving to hear all of this work, and I'm so pleased to be a part of this event. Thank you, Colin, so much for inviting me, and um, I, I, I'm just so happy to be here. So this book is A Quilt for David. It was just published by City Lights, and the book is documentary poetry. So in it, I take a situation that happened in 1991 in the Treasure Coast of Florida, where eight people accused their dentist of infecting them with HIV. And it was only about 10 years ago that I started to think like, how did that happen in that dental office? I remember hearing about the situation. And the more I research, um, just out of my own curiosity, the more I realized how much homophobia uh, was just, just saturated in every article that I had read. So I, I thought, oh, this, this gay man who had died of HIV and was a dentist, and was he um, a scapegoat? And so I just kept researching and writing. And 10 years later, um, I finished this collection. So I'm going to read a few poems for you tonight. Also, I want you to know that every detail in the book is a detail that I have found from my own personal research or things that I'd written. So I don't take any poetic license. I don't uh, have any of my own musings or I'm not fictionalizing anything. It's a situation saturated with misinformation and I didn't want to add to that. Two years, 10 months, and 29 days from diagnosis to death, David kept practicing, retired at 40 to die, from diagnosis to death, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality, retired at 40 to die. He used an aliases at doctor's offices hours away from his home, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. He used aliases at his doctor's offices hours away from his home. Kimberly, secretly sexually active, points her finger at David. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. She pointed her finger at him. From diagnosis to death was two years, 10 months, and 29 days. And David was a closeted gay man living in Stewart, Florida, and did not want to come out as a gay man and definitely did not want people to know about his HIV status. So when a KS lesion or a Carposi sarcoma lesion uh, was apparent, he tried to take care of it himself. For those who don't know or remember, a KS lesion is a brown purplish lesion uh, that um, people would actually consider themselves fortunate if a lesion was one that they could cover up like on their arm, but lesions on the neck or, or the face were especially concerning because it was kind of the, the giveaway that um, you had an autoimmune issue like HIV. And, and David had one on the roof of his mouth. Educated to heal, to provide comfort, to treat injuries of the mouth, there was one you couldn't handle. The sole KS sore on the roof of your mouth. Soon there were four. On an evening in May, you carted a dental accarditrary home, an electric device that cauterizes wounds. In the dimly lit bathroom mirror, you used it to send your palate. Red, wet, red hot electrical heat on wet tissue repeated the procedure burning each lesion. Dentist, heal thyself. A patient said you weren't talkative, but nice. We'll go out of your way to save her office copies of People Magazine. Eight months after your death, 
The weekly magazine's headline was about you. So David's first accuser was a, a young college student by the name of Kimberly Brialis. And Kimberly stated that she was, she alleged that she was a virgin. And this poem is actually about Kimberly's father. And I think it gives a window into maybe what it was like in that Bergalis household. In 1989, George Bergalis attempted to make a dental appointment and was declined. He was told the dentist was in the hospital. To ensure a safe sale of the business, patients were told that David had cancer. George directed the Fort Pierce Finance Department and said to his staff, you watch, the guy's probably got AIDS. And the last poem for you tonight is uh, the title poem, and it's an allusion to the AIDS memorial quilt. I'd sew a quilt for you. I would grab a needle, put the thread in my mouth, moisten the fibers together. I'd pierce into the eye, I'd hem, backstitch, side stitch, a remembrance of you. I'd put your name in large letters, wanting no one to forget that you died of it too. I'd sew you into that larger quilt because no one else has. I'd select patterns, design a quilt representing your lifelong loves. Kimberly has four panels. I'd sew for you, thimble on my thumb, push the threaded needle through the fabric. If I were to prick my finger and bleed, I wouldn't regret a single drop of blood or effort. Thank you. I just want to say that is one of the, tonight has been just amazing. I mean, everybody just fantastic. Uh, this is one of the best voices, Carrie's, I think we've ever done. I wish we could have done it in person because I know it would have been just so powerful. Um, so let me again say, Cecilia, Ilya, Katie, Khadija, and Stephen, thank you so much for doing this tonight. It is just just an amazing evening. Um, so we can do some questions now. Um, Joe, we do have, yeah, we do have a few questions in the Q and A. Um, so if y'all wanna go ahead and turn on your cameras and your microphones, um, the first one we actually have is for Cecilia. Um, and it comes from one of our patrons out there tonight named Sandra. And they ask, um, my grandmother was born Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, Rejsel, area two, Tarnau. Oh, you're muted, Cecilia. I'm sorry. Jejuf. Je okay. Yeah, way <laughs> off. I apologize. Uh -huh. um, and they say they visited a couple years ago, and I'm attempting to write about the landscape and history. How does the geography and history figure into your writing process? Is there something distinct about this process from your other writing? What a great question. I would say, um, I think it just, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, in this region and it's a really um, fascinating, it's, it's really beautiful. It's much less wild than it was 20 years ago when I first came or 25. Um, but I think it just um, affected me so deeply that it changed everything. Uh, for one thing, I, um, I certainly started being uh, much more aware of the natural world. I, certainly, I just was more aware of, I think, of landscape in general uh, as, a, as a presence, you know, the earth as a, as a presence. It's such a presence here. Um, so I think it changed my writing and it changed me. In terms of the process, I don't know if the process is different. I think I, I hear differently. I think I hear, I'm going to go ahead and sound like a crazy person. I think I hear some voices I didn't hear before. 
And I do, there are certain poems that I think of as I, uh, in my own mind, I call them the weird ancestor poems because I'm not sure who's speaking, but it's a kind of a collective um, voice that um, seems to be, seems to come from this, this landscape. So I guess the landscape, like it's the wrong use of literally, literally speaks to me. I mean, I hear it. I hear it. And I think that had never happened before in me to writing, but especially when I, I um, sit on the porch of the wooden house in the field in the moonlight and hope to see a wolf. Uh, and, you know, there's not another human being uh, within screaming distance. I really hear, you know, the land really, it's, it speaks to me. And thank you so very much, Cecilia. So the next question we have um, is for Ilya, but also not exclusively. Um, but Sandra asks, Deaf Republic overtly invokes deafness. What is the relationship between deafness and prosody? Are there musical accentual patterns that can be considered assistive? Can be, what was the last word, Steve, Joe? Assist assistive. Sister, okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I'm not quite sure I understood the second part, so I'll respond to the first part uh, about prosody. Um, I think it certainly does impact the choice of poetic tools and um, not necessarily, I don't know if choice is the right word, more um, what kind of poetic tools I personally end up using um and i discovered some of that later on after the poems are written sometime after i wrote dancing in odessa my first book um i looked at the published version because you can actually look at a published version and it's not a part of you anymore you know it's a separate object <laughs> and uh, i realized that majority of uh, by far overwhelming majority of poetic devices that i was using in that book had to do with an image. And of course, I didn't have hearing gates before I came to the United States, meaning that I was, the image was my native language, I was lip reading. Um, so yes, it has a lot to do with um, what kind of poetic devices we end up using. Now, once you know it, you might have a choice. Uh, but uh, also when you say lip reading, what does that mean? So like, um, I realized the years after being obsessed with Paul Celan's assault in German language, most beautiful and most tragic assault in German language. Um, I realized that I was so um, in love, madly in love with Celan's work. Yes, partly because I come from Eastern Europe um, and my family is Jewish, yes, of course. But also because, um, a lip reading person in Russian can read only about 50% of words on the lips. A lip reading person in English can read less than 45%. So you, you gotta make lips, you gotta go against the syntax, you gotta see them slightly differently. And that's not because you want to, it's not because you're innovating and trying to be hip, it's because you have no other choice. And I'm interested in that because for somebody like Celan, he wanted the prosody because he had no other choice. And I realized that later in life that poets like Dickinson or many others, uh, one can think of our poets who changed prosody because there's no other way to breathe. And I'm interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. So here's um, a general question for everyone, but maybe, um, you know, Khadija, we can start with you uh, with this one in particular. Um, and Ben asks, did the pandemic cause, facilitate you to write more or write less than usual? Oh my word, less, the, uh, <laughs> so much less. I had to take care of my family, so I had no time and then I was teaching, so no. And um, the pandemic piece that I read, I wrote in six weeks was a very concentrated period of time. Um, there was a call for that kind of work and I sent it to an editor and she 
was working with me on it to make it more essay-like. But it was so concentrated because I didn't ha- like I didn't have a choice but to write through the panic that I was feeling about what I saw unfolding. And even like back in January of 2020, I sort of saw it. I was like, this is not gonna be good. So I started stocking up on stuff then. And then when my sister got sick in New York and we didn't know, you know, and New York was imploding with cases, uh, I had to either write or get in my car. <laughs> but in between there, I, I'm between then and now, I've only written stuff um, that people have asked me for. I think I've written two poems and like a rage essay. Thank you, Khadija. Cecilia, what about you in Poland? You know, how is how has your writing been affected by the pandemic? You go. You saw the ooh face. So <laughs> I've only been in Poland for about a month, a little over a month now. So I spent the pandemic in my space in Los Angeles, where I have I haven't spent more than a couple of months at a time uh, in many, many, many years. Um, So I was suddenly, it was like, I was going hundred miles an hour because I was here on a Fulbright and then they, the um, embassy sent, they just sent everybody home. They said, go home. We don't know what's gonna happen. The world might end. So um, I got back to Los Angeles and then uh, there I was for the longest place I have ever been anywhere in my life. Um, And uh, I think it was good for my writing. You know, um, I didn't, unlike Khadija, I didn't have, you know, my family's in Kentucky. I had, I had uh, sort of decided that I would feed one friend who was um, my, in my bubble. She was my bubble. Um, So I felt like I can take care of this one person. Um, but other than that, I, my time was my own. And I read a lot and, uh, and, I, and I wrote a lot. The hard thing was the days became very shapeless. And maybe like with Khadija, with having you know, other people to, to care, to look after, but the days became very shapeless. So it was, it's, gets very easy for the time to get away from you you know, when you don't have uh, any structure. But I'm a person who's very uh, wedded to her routines and her rituals. And I manage to do them no matter where I am. Um, so uh, so I, I would say that I wrote uh, more, not, not a lot more, but I was able to write in a different way because I was suddenly, after 20 some years, I was suddenly all in one place. Thank you, Cecilia. Katie, what about you? Um, I think (laughs) it's uh, having cancer, I was diagnosed in August, 2020. Um, So I really, <laughs> my pandemic really took a U-turn at that point, you know, right where everybody else, I felt like people hadn't seen other people in months. And I was walking through crowded hospitals, the cancer ward, like literally in order to get to my physical therapy appointment, I had to go down in the same elevator as the people who were going to the COVID treatment center. Um, I was, I was with people all of the time. At one point, getting ready for radiation, I had six people touching me simultaneously. Like it was such an, a different experience, my pandemic. Um, and weirdly, I was not expecting that when I was diagnosed that I just, I wrote a lot. I wrote copiously and it was coming out like, um, boy, I'm just thinking bodily functions here, but it was just, it was roaring out. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, uh, I mean, really it's sort of dried up. Um, I, I was diagnosed with heart failure as a result of the chemotherapy. I forced one more poem out about that. And then since then it's been uh, just a real dry spell since June or so. 
Um, but I also feel like I, I almost feel like I need some healing to happen <laughs> before anything else can happen. Cause I was sort of going, you know, hundred miles an hour with cancer treatment. And then I was going hundred miles an hour trying to also be writing and, and push as much as I could at that point. And I, I find myself sort of now washed up on the shore somewhere, just trying to get my breath back. Um, so, uh, more is the short answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. Ilya, what about you? Well, I was watching Katie go through all of that. So that was my experience. Um, I do have to say that um, maybe it's because I write in a different, uh, in, a, in a language that's not my native language. Um, the whole process for me is rather slow, always been very slow, 10 or more years between books. And I agree, I agree to like it. I think um, I would never say that, okay, pandemic influences me right now in this way because pandemic is still ongoing. I don't know you know, in five years how pandemic influences me. Um, I don't know who I am right now. I don't know once right now is over. So thank you so much, Ilya. Stephen, let's finish up with you. And then I have a specific question for you to follow up after that. Oh, nice. Um, I would, you know, I who I deeply identify as a poet and anytime something emotionally loaded or charged happens in my life, I've been accustomed to writing about it. And yet during the pandemic, at the start of it, I wasn't really writing at all. And what surprised me is I started baking and not just baking, but um, obsessively baking. And I, I jokingly said that I was stress baking and then stress eating. And so they, they just kind of, uh, they work together. But I was working on a biscuit recipe and Colin knows about these adventures. I, I confided in him. You know, at one point in time, I went through 50 pounds of flour. I, I live alone. So, I mean, it's a lot of just like waking up and, and it actually reminded me though of poetry in the process of just determination and wanting to get the experience right. And what was interesting is once I felt like I perfected the recipe, which was over a year ago, I've only made biscuits once or twice since then. And I think that's kind of similar to poetry is that once the poem feels complete enough, right? We, we just kind of move on. Um, so that really surprised me how little I wrote I mean, I had all this time similar to Cecilia, like my family doesn't live in town, they're out of town. And, and yet um, I, I didn't run to writing or reading at all. Um, and, and I'm actually okay with that. Um, it, I was just having a very different experience. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen. Now, let me get to this specific question for you from Jessica. And she asks, the real life story behind the poems you read tonight is so fascinating yet sad, for lack of a better word. What mm -hmm. caused you to devote 10 years of writing about an event so sorrowful? She really enjoyed your reading and thanks you for sharing the few poems from your book this evening. Oh, thank you, Jessica, that's so sweet. Um, and I think that's such a good question. I, one, part of it was just curiosity. What started it is my thought was what happened, what happened in that dental office? And I felt like I was writing about that dental office. And what I realized is I was actually writing about what was going on outside of that dental office, what was happening in Florida at that time, what was happening in our culture in terms of their feelings about uh, people with AIDS, about gay men, of uh, what, you know, about virginity. So, there was something where I knew like I was tapping onto something greater than just this story. I also, once I kind of suspected that, you know, this gay villainization was happening, this gay scapegoating. And so I felt really um, drawn to helping vindicate this man's life and legacy. And in terms of it being sad, I think that um, I'm very in touch with my my sad my own personal sadness as well as my loneliness, and I feel like sometimes they were matched. Um, 
in writing this and, and I felt kind of met. Those aren't feelings that I run from. I, um, I, I don't let myself get carried away in them. And so I think that's, um, and that's always been helpful in my writing, but it's so clear to all of the poets we heard tonight as well. I think that as poets, we really kind of face feelings and emotions and address them. And that's just what I was doing in this work that wasn't about me, but about someone else. Thank you so very much, Stephen. So we have one more question this evening, and it is actually for Khadija. Um, and it's from one of our um, participants named Ruth. And Ruth asks, could you talk about your use of Shih Tzu as its form being so flexible? I wondered what constraints you felt as you decided what moments to depict and what to leave out? Well, I'm, that's a great question. And I love that form because you can stretch out in it, but it, there are also like specific themes and rules that you can follow, like the lists that you heard and ordinary moments and memories and statistics, numbers, things like that. Um, it's about a thousand years old um, as a form and was talked about as like, uh, 10th century blog, right? So obser observations of daily life. And a poem was not coming to me when I was trying to write. Regular prose didn't feel right to me, but I could move around freely in the Zuhitsu. And that's uh, why I chose it. And in terms of what I decided to leave out, I think I focused more on the pieces that uh, were more imagistic and fit in with the theme the best. There's certainly many that were cut. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so very much. Well, at least from our end here at the Georgia Center for the Book, thank you so much to Colin and Poetry Atlanta for once again, putting this fantastic Voices Carry reading together. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Khadija. Thank you, Stephen, so very much. Thank you, of course, to Karis Books and More, the bookseller this evening, you all have seen the links to order these wonderful books in the chats and we encourage you to do so. And if you don't order from um, Karis Books and more here in Decatur, we encourage you of course, to purchase from our local independent bookstores, wherever you may be, they do so much for the community. So do your best to give back to them for all that they've done for us. Because of course we have to love a poet, we need to buy poetry. It just makes us better people. So thank you all so very much very fantastic reading. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you all again very, very soon. Thank you, poets. See you next year. <laughs>